Hello, everybody, and welcome to our introduction to acute renal failure. Very, very high yield for the USMLE and something you're going to deal with quite a bit on the wards. So we're going to go over sort of a general overview, but I have a lot of videos coming up. We're going to talk about pre-renal failure, uh, tubulo-interstitial diseases. I have a couple videos on glomerular nephrosis. Um, that's, uh, I broke it up because there's so many different causes. Um, and then I also have a video on post renal failure. So we will go into this in pretty good detail because again, it is very high yield. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so renal insufficiency. There's a number of causes and they are divided into three categories, pre-renal, intrinsic or intrarenal, and post-renal. And intrinsic is divided further into the glomerular uh, nephroses and the tubulo interstitial diseases. Um, it is synonymous with azotemia, which just means an elevated BUN and creatinine level. However, if they start to develop symptoms due to the elevated uh, nitrogenous waste products, then the diagnosis shifts to uremia. And what kind of symptoms do we look for here? Pericarditis, bleeding, this would be platelet type bleeding because uh, the, the nitrogenous products will interfere with platelet degranulation and then susceptibility to infection because the white blood cells cannot degranulate. When do we dialyze? This is important that you know this. So acidemia, but we're talking here about severe acidemia. So a blood pH of less than 7.1. Electrolyte abnormalities with EKG changes in particular. So hyperkalemia, what would we see here? Peaked T waves. You should know that. That's a finding of hyperkalemia. A little bit of hyperkalemia, mild hyperkalemia, not a big deal. Uh, but you need to get an EKG anytime a patient has hyperkalemia because you need to make sure that their heart is not at risk for an arrhythmia. Intoxications, um, aspirin tox intoxication, lithium intoxication, isopropanol, magnesium, ethylene glycol or antifreeze, methanol intoxication, infection related to uremia also is I2. So again here with these significant uremia complications, we are dialyzing. If there's significant fluid overload does, that does not respond to diuretic therapy, we can do uh, dial, dialysis uh, in that case as well. And then these uremic features uh, as mentioned. So A-E-I-O-U, the vowels. This is our basic workup for renal failure. So we're going to get a CBC. Why? Because there are some uh, of, of these uh, renal diseases that are associated with infection. Um, and we're also going to see there are some that are allergic, which we would see elevated eosinophils. Um, so we, we, there, there are a number of manifestations with these renal diseases that can show up on CBC. You can have a thrombocytopenia, elevated white count. Uh, if you're losing blood, let's say with a bladder cancer, um, you can have uh, an anemia. So we want to get a CBC. We want to get a CMP. Now, why am I not saying BMP? Because on step three CCS, you can order a CMP. And a CMP will have some things that we also want uh, that's not on the BMP. And that includes a serum calcium and liver function tests. So order the CMP, okay? Serum magnesium. Magnesium is not included on the CMP, at least on step three CCS. So you'll need to order that separately. Then, so, so we're looking at CBC and electrolytes here. Uh, then we want to look at the urine. We really want to get a good idea of what's going on with the urine. So get a basic urinalysis. You can also add a dipstick protein to that. Um, then get a microscopic analysis, looking at the urine under the microscope. What we're looking for here, possibly crystals. We might be looking for casts. Um, those are going to help give us an idea of what we're dealing with. Urine sodium and urine, urine potassium. And then a renal ultrasound should always be ordered as well. 
These are some of the labs in acute renal failure. So the urine sodium, which I already mentioned, that's the concentration of sodium in the urine, and this reflects reuptake of sodium. So if you have a high urine sodium, that's telling you that you are not reabsorbing sodium. That may point to a tubular disease. Um, and if you have a low urine sodium, that's telling you that you're, you're reabsorbing a lot of sodium. You're probably going to see that in a pre-renal or a post-renal failure. Fractional excretion of sodium uh, really uh, kind of tracks with the urine sodium. So if you have less urine sodium, obviously you're going to have a lower fractional excretion of sodium. Um, all this is is the percentage of sodium excreted compared to the amount that is first filtered into the urine. Um, normal is about 1%. If you're anything less than that, you're probably dealing with pre-renal. If it's significantly more than that, you're probably dealing with an intrinsic renal disease where the, the nephron is unable to reabsorb sodium. Urine osmolality really gives us an idea of how concentrated the urine is. So if you are unable to reabsorb water, you're going to have a very dilute urine. If you're reabsorbing water like crazy, again, usually with the pre-renal and the post-renals, you're going to have a very concentrated urine or a higher urine osmolality. Uh, BUN creatinine ratio is really useful for picking out pre-renal failure. Uh, in pre-renal failure, you're going to have a BUN creatinine of greater than 20 to 1. Why? Because the more we are reabsorbing stuff, uh, the more BUN we're going to reabsorb. So we reabsorb BUN at a much faster rate than the creatinine builds up. And so you will have a higher ratio in pre-renal failure. Uh, the presence of blood cells, casts, and sediment usually point to an intrinsic renal failure because some stuff is being lost, either red blood cells, white blood cells. Um, you can lose uh, hemoglobin, myoglobin. Stuff is getting into the urine that is not supposed to be there. So that really points to an intrinsic renal failure. These are the labs um, comparing these four different categories. So you should know these really cold uh, because these are very, very, very important. All right, so here I kind of break things down. Now you don't need to know this right away uh, because I'm gonna go into these. I have a video here, I have three videos here, and I have a video here. So I've got five videos, you can watch them and get really good at this because you need to know how to interpret these labs because at that point then you can try to figure out an etiology. Um, so this is kind of a, um, a diagram of how we can go about that. Um, so with the pre-renal, again here, remember that we're reabsorbing a ton of sodium and a ton of water. So we're going to have a low FENA. We're going to have a high urine osmol osmolality. We're going to have a high BUN creatinine ratio. Um, with the intrinsic renal failure, it's basically the opposite, and we'll see sediment. At that point, we really need to know uh, what kind of casts are in the urine, if any. We need to know if there is high eosinophils, and you can see here that there are uh, a plethora of causes. And then with the post-renal, look, because we have usually obstruction here, look for anuria or difficulty urinating, look for our flank mass, which is points to uh, a hydronephrosis or a suprapubic mass, which points to a distended bladder. Um, so here are the many causes of pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal, and I am going to be going over all of these uh, in the subsequent videos.